Couple days ago, I was at a one of the new bike clubs, and uh, one of the guys comes up to me and he says, "National, man, when are you gonna write something about uh, how new motorcycle clubs should run their business from day to day?" And uh, I, I was like, "Wow." They say, you know, all we ever hear from you old guys is how we're doing everything wrong. We're a pop-up club and we ain't doing nothing right. And we never hear about what, what we should be doing. Every time they talk about what we should be doing, they're screaming at us and hollering at us. We, we can never just get it um, the right kind of way. So it dawned on me, yeah, I guess I need to write a book about how a motorcycle clubs should run their business day to day, especially new motorcycle clubs, brand new motorcycle clubs that just popped up. And uh, I don't like to use the word pop up motorcycle club because I think it's such a um, uh, just, just just like a just a terrible kind of way to refer to somebody. I mean, in reality, we were all pop up motorcycle clubs at one time. So. Um, why would we call somebody such a, a nasty name? See, the only thing that makes you a pop-up motorcycle club is if you popped up one day and then you popped up, popped away the next day. So then you would be considered a fly-by-night or something like that. And the only thing that can tell that is time. So, I mean, all motorcycle clubs were pop-up motorcycle clubs at one time. So uh, we're 43 years old, but to a motorcycle club like maybe the booze fighters uh we're we're a pop-up because they were around in the 1940s so you have to think uh, about what it is you're trying to convey when you talk to people and, and what we want is for the clubs to flourish and so we want to teach them to do the kinds of things that will ensure their longevity rather than the kinds of things that we all know uh, won't ensure the longevity. So if we want to teach people things instead of approaching them negatively, we should approach them uh, in a uh, uh, kind of a way that allows them to move forward um, in, in a cool kind of way. So um, I'm going to do a few of these about uh, until I get the book written, which is going to be called something like day-to-day uh, -day operations of a motorcycle club by uh, or, or a brand new motorcycle club, something like that. But um, these books, I mean, it's, they're kind of hard to write. Like, it takes like six months to write a stupid book. So uh, maybe I can get some of the information out beforehand. I want to take a few shameless moments to plug my books. First of all, I would like to plug Prospects Bible, prospectsbible.com. This has been a bestseller on and off the bestselling list now for two years. Thank you for those who support me with this book. And people are buying this book all over the world, even motorcycle clubs in Great Britain and Australia and stuff are buying Prospects Bible. So get this book for your prospects. I'm coming up with one uh, Prospects Bible, like the sponsor's Bible, to show clubs how the the sponsors should be running the prospect program. I also want to tell... Now, to me, this is the greatest book I've ever written, and this is the one that uh, nobody really knows about yet, the Motorcycle Club PRO's Bible. The PRO, we're going to talk about this subject so much because um, a strong PRO can save the reputation of your club all day long. PROs are far more than just uh, party favor hander outers. They, uh, they have a, uh, a strong mission. I'm very proud of my newest book, The Prospects Bible for Women's Motorcycle Clubs. And this is the first book I've ever written uh, to deal with women on the motorcycle set. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this book to me is really kind of amazing because I want to to deal with the embodiment of women's motorcycle clubs and what they should be doing and how they should be coming in in a traditional-like fashion. And I say that uh, because I see so many motorcycle clubs that are not, uh, when I say women's motorcycle clubs, they're not doing stuff like prospecting people and stuff like that. And what we learn from that is that uh, if your colors are not good enough to be worked for and people don't have what we call skin in the game, then it's very easy for them to toss your colors aside on Facebook and say, toodaloo, uh, too bad I couldn't be with you. And I, I even had one of my dear friends when she joined her club and she didn't prospect. I told her, baby girl, you're not going to be there long. And sure enough, when she left, there was the big Facebook post. And uh, she got mad at me for jumping on her saying, no, you don't do that on Facebook.
but there's there's a lot to teach so uh we're going to go forward with it so prospectsbibleforwomen.com prospectsbible.com mcprosbible.com and my latest book uh, that's coming out in September has nothing to do with motorcycle clubs. My first venture out of motorcycle clubs, it's called Kill Proof, the talk. And Kill Proof is a book about surviving the police stop, renegade cops, and angry vigilantes with guns. And you should get this for your young men of color, especially black men of color, young men of color, young women of color too, because I still see a whole lot happening and folks getting hurt and shot and murdered with two cops sitting on top of them. But there are some things that we can do to kind of negate that. And that's why I'm writing the Kill Proof book. So it's the killproofbook.com and you can pre-order it coming out in, uh, uh, coming out in about 30 days. Now, I got to write that book fast. Now, this is a book that's not mine. And I, I want to use this book to, to illustrate some things that we're going to talk about when it comes to... Um, how motorcycle clubs, uh, especially new motorcycle clubs, should be running uh, their business day to day. Um, and, and so to, 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 to get this um, started, um, I, I wanted to go back to a mythical club, um, uh, a club called the Booze Fighters. And this book is by Bill Hayes. And it talks about the evolution of the club, the, the booze fighters. And why are the booze fighters and their evolution important to you? Well, they are significant to the history of motorcycle clubs, especially when it comes to the outlaw one percenter and how the whole one percenter thing got started. And, and it gave rise to what has happened in the culture today. It started here with the booze fighters. So. Uh, what I think is cool about this is that we will be looking at the booze fighters and what they did. And I think it's cool because I have the, uh, somebody was trying to call me, I, but I have the bylaws of the booze fighters from 1946. The bylaws of the booze fighters from 1946. So if we could get back to how they were doing things in like 1946 to see how this, this, this really progressed. Uh, this might give you some indication on um, how perhaps you should be running your brand new motorcycle club day to day. So before we get into the bylaws, which are really cool, let's just talk about this for a minute. Some of you guys will know the story. You can find this story on, a on uh, AMA. What's that? American Motorcyclist Association, which is a very strong organization um, that most of us have never even heard about or belong to. But there's so much education there. So um, this book was... Uh, printed in 2005. I've had it forever. Uh, it says, meet the original wild ones and their exciting tales of riding, racing, and brotherhood. At a 1947 motorcycle race in Hollister, California, a small number of motorcyclists, members of a club called the Booze Fighters, knocked back a few beers and engaged in some street racing. Thanks to a stage photograph and sensational, artic and sensational article in Life magazine, this fracas was blown out of proportion which is something that happens every time the media deals with us, they blow our stuff out of proportion. One of the reasons you need to have a good PRO. Um, blown out of proportion and the mythology surrounding the event formed the basis for the 1953 film, The Wild Ones, uh, starring Marlon Brando. And The Wild Ones were like, the, that, that was like one of the biggest, strongest films of the, of the old days that uh, made everybody really fall in love with this culture of the outlaw biker. Um, Let's see. Together, the Hollister riot and the film jump-started the outlaw motorcycle club scene. So it started here with these folks, this whole idea of the one percenter. Through interviews with founders and surviving members of the Booze Fighters, um, current member Bill Hayes, with the help of researcher and club historian Jim J.Q. Quattlebaum, presents the tale of the original Booze Fighter Motorcycle Club. So when you get a book like this, you get to read about how they did it like back in the day. And they got these cool pictures. And if you're looking for an African-American one, it's the uh, one written uh, uh, about um, the East Bay Dragons. It's like the only one out there. And uh, I'm working on a couple right now myself to add to the uh, culture and add uh, our, our uh, participation in this culture to the, the annals of what's going on out there in the world. But you get all these neat pictures and you get to see how they did it. And 
this will give you an idea of the purity uh, of the motorcycle world before we had all of these kinds of things. So if we go to the um, press releases that were written about this book in 2005, this was written June 14, 2005. So the Booze Fighters Motorcycle Club book is a tell-all of riding, racing, motorcycle, brotherhood, and it was written to dispel biker myths. So like so many other young, fresh from World War II vets of the late 1940s. So we get to something that a lot of people don't know about, that a lot of these uh, motorcycle clubs were started by returning World War II vets who were looking for the camaraderie that they had in the military. They were suffering from things that we called battle fatigue and shell shock back then. Battle fatigue and shell shock are now known as post-traumatic stress disorder. They didn't have a way to, to, to fix people back then. They didn't care. They just turned them loose in society kind of like they do today. So um, they joined motorcycle clubs. They joined that. They had the spirit, uh, the camaraderie, and they set them up kind of like the military. You had a president and a vice president. You had a road captain. The road captain was the president while the, the, while the club was on the road, therefore kind of like a jump master uh, in an airplane. He's the, he's the captain until uh, uh, the guys get onto the ground. He's the guy responsible for getting everybody to the ground. So these returning World War II vets, uh, the original wild ones, were the founding members and associates of the Booze Fighter Motorcycle Club. So if you got a new club, you guys are founders, believe it or not. 1920, 25, you're founders. You are the founding fathers. You're the godfathers. Your conduct and how you carry yourself will set your motorcycle club to either soar or not soar. Your conduct, your knowledge, your gaining knowledge, this is what sets your motorcycle club up to last for decades. The founding fathers of the mighty Black Sabbath Motorcycle Club Nation at 18, 19, and 20, barely brand new married guys, they had no idea that their motorcycle club would span the coast from coast to coast with chapters across the nation and people they had never even met that weren't even born yet would ascribe to their ideals of motorcycle riding, loving brotherhood and the sisterhood of the Sisters of the Cross and the Goddesses they had no idea this was coming. So you don't know. 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 You don't know how great what you are putting together can be. Um, so the founding members and associates of the Boost Fighters Motorcycle Club were racing to recapture their youth. I like that because I feel really old. Uh, racing to recapture their youth, have a good time, ride fast motorcycles, and hang out at their favorite watering hole, the All-American, with the guys they could count on. If Can you see it building right now? Uh, brotherhood, brotherhood, brotherhood. Uh, the founding members, they wanted to recapture their youth, they wanted to have a good time, they wanted to ride fast motorcycles and hang out at their favoring water hole with people they could, guys they could count on. The original Wild Ones, the tales of the Booze Fighter Motorcycle Club by current member Bill Hayes, is a candid, gritty, and often humorous look at the adventures of this California crew unintentionally brought into the spotlight at a 1947 motorcycle race in Hollister. So what happened in Hollister? In Hollister... These booze fighter guys were racing, having a good time, and uh, a Time Life reporter wanted to take a picture. And so they thought, okay, that's cool. So he got some beers and stuff and put around, and the guy kicks back, and he looks drunk as hell. And it made the, the AMA look bad. And when the AMA looked bad, they had a negative impact because the AMA was the biggest thing in motorcycle so like this like the negative impact on the AMA and the AMA railed against it to say that they had nothing to do with these kind of people now a statement is attributed to the AMA that the AMA never says they can't find any documented thing that they ever said this but the statement that is attributed to them is that the AMA came out with a statement and said these rowdy people acting real raucous and all this uh, are not indicative I'm paraphrasing 99% of the people in, in the motorcycle club world are respectable, blah, 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 and only 1% of those people are outlaws. And outlaws took that 1%er uh, nomenclature from that statement. At least that's what many say. Now, again, the AMA says they never said that. But it came from somewhere, and that's where the 1%er stuff came from. 
and it came as a result of a picture taken by these booze fighters, which is why I tell your PROs, be on the game. Always be on the game because they can take you and make your reputation look terrible if you're not on the game and, and handling your press. So anyway, back to this. Uh, so it was, it was blown so out of proportion. So these guys were just having some fun, but thanks to a stage photo that ended up on the cover of Life Magazine. Life Magazine. What is Life Magazine? Some of you guys are too young to know. It was like the, the biggest, baddest magazine for like decades and decades and decades. It was huge. It was like 17 inches tall, about 11, 12 inches wide. And parents and stuff used to use them on their coffee tables like Jet Magazines for cover, uh, for, uh, for like uh, 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 decoration. Uh, they, they were great books and they, uh, Time Life has all kinds of books and they were a great news organization. I believe they're gone now. So this guy sensationalized this fairly innocent escapade and the mythology around it, making these guys look like barbarians out there. And it was so cool that Marlon Brando, the biggest star of all times at that time, made a movie called The uh, uh, Wild Ones. And so that incident became known as the Hollister Riot. The Hollister Riot? One guy on a posed picture uh, with some beer cans that had been laid around, beer bottles. They didn't have cans back then, like beer bottles. That became the Hollister Riot. So uh, what they want to do with the book is dispel those, those rumors through interviews uh, with some of these guys. They want to dispel those rumors and tell you what really happened back then and what uh, those folks really were. Um, Let's see. I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Let's see. Is this any of this? Uh, so this is them telling you that, you know, one percenters aren't all really that bad and they should be loved too. And we love them all. So I want to get to this part here. This is the uh, really neat part that I, I found. I was doing some research for my next topic to talk on and the guys were telling me, you know, Black Dragon, why don't you write a book about how we should run our motorcycle clubs day to day? So I thought I would take you back to, like, the original bylaws of uh, the booze fighters from 1946. And let's start that as a basis for uh, how cool and how, how maybe how you might develop how your motorcycle club moves by looking at how the original people kind of thought of biking and motorcycling. So uh, there are 13... Uh, bylaws, which is kind of really cool because my bylaws are like ridiculously like pages. Um, of course, they didn't have the internet back then. So here we go. One, to become a booze fighter, a man must attend four meetings consecutively. You mean in a row? How many times, uh, who has attended the last four meetings in a row in your motorcycle club? This is, th they don't mean... Uh, I can make two, but my wife won't let me come to the... They don't mean, well, I really got to work and, you know, I'm really busy. And they don't... In order to be considered, a man must attend four meetings consecutively and be voted on by secret ballot. Now, the secret ballot. The secret ballot is important because the motorcycle club is a secret and exclusive organization. And we don't have to discuss in front of everybody what my vote is. My vote is my vote and he can either get in or he can't. And you don't have to embarrass me by having this, this, this big old, we can have a secret ballot. That's how they did it back then. By all members present. You mean if you don't come to the meeting, you might not get to vote on who gets to get in the club? Wow. And must not be opposed by more than three members. Wow. Well, I've seen motorcycle clubs where if one person votes, you can't get in. You can't get in. But these people said you have to be present to vote. And you can't be opposed by more than three members. So one jerk can't mess it all up. It's kind of interesting. They put the onus on being at the MC with the brothers. And if you ain't there, it don't count. The club is closed at 20 members is rule two. The club is close to 20 members? Yeah, you see, they were trying to have a brotherhood. They were trying to be tight. And 400 members is a really cool look going down the road. But a chapter 
was closed at 20 members because those were your brothers and the people that you needed to know and grow with and be good with. If you got a motorcycle club with 100 people in it, can you call 100 names? Do you know 100 numbers? Do you know 100 birthdays? Do you know 100 times when somebody's parents died? It's kind of interesting. Uh, rule number three, the initiation fee is $2. Motorcycle clubs are about you paying your damn dues. You needed $2 to get in, and dues are 50 cents a week. And uh, let's see. With, when a member is voted in, he must pay a sum of 250 So there's a voted in sum. There's a weekly sum of 50 cents and initiation fee of $2. And back in 1946, I think that was some good money. We need to look and see. I think that wasn't any chump change right there. So it takes money to ride these things. It takes a dedication to be there. And it takes $2. Wow. I know so many people back on their dues. Mm. If a member misses three meetings consecutively without a substantial explanation, he will be voted on again. Doesn't say suspension, doesn't say fine. It says we'll vote on your ass again to make sure if you're worthy to be with us, if you really want to be with us, we're going to vote on you again by all the members present, and it can't be opposed by more than three people. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Five, any member who is absent without a reasonable excuse from the club activities will automatically be dropped from the club. Ouch! Are you seriously telling me that if you miss a club activity without a reasonable excuse, you're gone? These folks wasn't playing no games back in 1946 with your ass. They were serious as heart attacks. All right. Rule number six. If a member misses a meeting without a reasonable excuse, he'll be fined a dollar. You were fined for missing meetings because we're serious about this thing we're doing. Number seven, officers will be elected every three, officers will be elected every three months. Officers will be elected every three months if they are still living. Officers will be elected every three months if they are still living. That's interesting. You see, you are accountable to the club and as long as you are accountable to the club, you shouldn't be worried. Every three months comes up, you re-vote. It's all good, baby. I've been the president for 15 years. I get voted on every three months. It's good. These guys were serious about the business and serious about accountability. You want to know how to run a brand new motorcycle club? Be serious about your accountability. Allow no shirkers. Be tough with the brotherhood. Be serious about the brotherhood. And, uh, you know, be cool about being elected if you're still living. Rule eight, there will be a fine of one dollar for any member not wearing his sweater to meetings, club activities, races, etc., without a reasonable excuse. Well, this must have been the days before you had a cut. So you had a sweater and the sweater needed to be on. Bottom line, you needed to have your damn sweater on. And if you weren't going to have your sweater on at the function or at the club meeting, or any other place where it was reasonable that a reasonable member would be expected to have the damn sweater on? Fine. One dollar. We need our dollar. I think we're going to get some sweaters. That might be cool. All right. Uh, number nine. Any member leaving or being voted out of the club. Now, this is not a new one. Check this out. Any member leaving or being voted out of the club will either remove the lettering from his sweater or sell it back to the club. You don't get to keep this. This ain't yours. This, this belongs to the Black Sabbath. We need all our stuff back when you go. You need to cut that off and cut this off. Cut this. That's the symbols of ours. Cut. We want your name back. We gave you your damn name, too. We want that back. You're no longer called old school. We don't know what you're called. Okay? You can't have our name. 
You can't have our patch. We're going to take our toys and our sandbox box and we're going to go on back on home. And you go on on because you're not part of us anymore. You don't get to keep our groovy little uh, uh, pendant. You don't get to keep nothing that's ours because you're not ours anymore. You went and did something else somewhere. Or you, you disgraced us or whatever you did. So give us our uh, stuff back. And there won't be no problems. Some clubs will buy it back from you. Other clubs say, nah, you just got to give it back. But know when you come into a motorcycle club, new motorcycle club people, that this is not yours, even if you pay for it. I'm not giving that vest back. I paid for it. No, it's ours. We own the logos. We own the trademark. It's our intellectual property. And we don't want to have to get rough about this thing. Ten. It is strictly against all club rules for any one member to bring more than one case of liquor or one keg or beer of beer or wine to a meeting. So I suppose you can only bring one keg. Uh, keeps you from being so drunk that you kill yourself on your bike. Huh? They had that concept back in 1946. This was before Mothers Against Drunk Driving. This is before all these statistics that we have on DUIs and what they do. 11. There will never be any women in any way affiliated in any way, shape, or form with the Booze Fighters Motorcycle Club or its subsidiaries. 12. If any member of the Booze Fighters or its subsidiaries is found guilty of crapping out on his back, having the club name where it can't be seen, or not having his sweater on when being crapped out, he will be fined a dollar. I'm not sure what crapping out on his back means or being crapped out. What I gather from this is that you're not going to disgrace us in your sweater, our cut. You're not going to be found crapped out on your back, which must be passed out maybe from drinking too much alcohol or something. And if you are crapped out, uh, or, or whatever the case may be, if you have... Uh, your sweater on uh, and it's not properly seen, then um, you uh, will be fined a dollar. Someone said, Angela, why didn't you explain number <laughs> number 11? Is, is there an explanation necessary? <laughs> this is a 1% motorcycle club. I think it's pretty obvious why there are no women. Okay, 13. No one. Oh, my God. I, I hadn't even read this one before. This is, ouch. Okay. I'll try to approach this one softly. No member will be completely without a motor for more than six months. If he is, he will be automatically dropped from the club. Now, a motor is what they used to call motorcycles. So they don't mean you could have the bike with no motor in it. They meant if you are completely without a motorcycle for six months, you're no longer a boost fighter. And it's just that simple. So we learned a few things here from looking at how they did it in 1946. When we want to compare ourselves with uh, how maybe we should want to run a brand new motorcycle club. What we find is that, did you notice there was not one thing in there about supporting the set? Did you notice there was not one thing in there about how many nightclubs on the motorcycle set you should be going to? Uh, did you notice that there is nothing in there about... Um, how cool you should look or how many girls you could get from the from the other motor there's nothing about any of that bs in there there is only stuff about the brotherhood how to become closer with the members of your mc you had to be there for the meetings you had to wear your damn colors you had to pay your damn dues you had to make your damn meetings and club functions. You had to have an excuse 
for not being where you were supposed to be. You had to represent us. You had to make meetings consecutively. You had to, to be a part of the damned MC. Boy, they really knew what they were doing in 1946. Holy moly. So, uh, if you're starting a new motorcycle club up and you want to know day to day what you need to be doing, look back to our good friends, the Booze Fighters, and read their book. Read Wheels on Soul, too. Uh, and definitely read my books. Whatever you do, read those. And get a idea of how it was done in the old days. We don't want to do it exactly like they did in the old days. Nobody's saying to have 13 bylaws. But we we want to get back to the taste of what this thing is about. It's about loving your brothers more than yourself. God damn, stop saying my, my, my. Stop saying I, I, I. And start saying we, we, we. Us, us, us. Ours, ours, ours. The national president uh, before me of the Black Sabbath Nation, the father, Paul Pep Perry, drummed this in my head for 20 damn years. Stop saying me, me, me. 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 And start saying we. Speak a little French. We. Ours. We, yes. We can. We will. We do this. We are the Booze Fighters, MC. We are the Mighty Black Sabbath Motorcycle Club Nation. We are who are you? That's who we are. We stand for one another. We are together as one. T-A-O, together as one. And as one, we cannot be separated. We cannot be divided. And our motorcycle club brotherhood and sisterhood will be strong forever and ever. Amen. 43 years, people. The mighty Black Sabbath Motorcycle Club Nation. But your history is yet to be written. So write it good. Make it strong. Make it something that people will follow chapter after chapter across the United States of America from coast to coast for decades, maybe even centuries. I've done my thing. I'm old as hell. What the hell are you going to do? Who are you going to be? What is your MC going to be? Don't let anybody put you in the classification of being a pop-up motorcycle club. You're only a pop-up if you don't last. And I'm sure you all will last. Ride hard, young brothers and sisters. And uh, pray for one another. Love one another. And be good to one another. And if you do those things and ride your iron, you'll be all right. You don't have to worry about how many bikes show up on at the such and such, how many trophies. You didn't read in that bylaws. And we must have every trophy at the club. We must take every trophy. We got to show up and that's what we do. We get the trophies. We're going to talk about support in one of my videos, what support really is. What support really is. Like when one of your brothers goes down in another motorcycle club and you go to that motorcycle club and you take care of their members like they were your own members. I don't mean you drop by one time. I mean you drop by once or twice or three times a week for the whole two months that they're in the hospital. That's support. Anybody can have the vigil and go cry and stand by the candles. But where are you when all the lights are gone? That's support. That's how you support the set. That's how you support other motorcycle clubs. That's how you support brothers and sisters. So that's a whole new subject that we're going to talk about. We're going to come up with that. But I really wanted to touch this topic about what uh, what it is to run because one of my brothers here in Atlanta a, a young kid kid young man uh, who was the president of another motorcycle club asked me why don't you write a book about 
what we should be doing day to day. So I'm going to start these videos. And one of the first things I want to talk about in summary, of course, was looking at one of the old clubs and how they did it and maybe kind of aligning yourself on the ideas of, uh, of that to establish what you're going to be. Bottom line, this is your stuff. You're going to make it what it needs to be. You use this other stuff as reference points to make sure your clock is adjusted and calibrated. And then you fly. And hopefully you'll fly on these two wheels and you'll ride like you got some damn sense and you'll be alive to put me in the ground when it's my time to go, not the other way around. I love all you bikers. You make me feel great. You write to me and you hear an old man rant. And so I feel important like I'm not just rusting away. Oh, by the way, I've lost 51 pounds since April. I need you bikers to get your fatness stuff together. I'm tired of going to funerals for people dying of heart attacks. Um, I love you all. Prospects Bible, prospectsbible.com. Prospects Bible for Women Motorcycle Clubs at prospectsbibleforwomen.com. The Motorcycle Club PRO's Bible, mcprosbible.com. And Kill Proof, the killproofbook.com. And you can get all those books from Amazon except Kill Proof. You got to go to the killproofbook.com to get Kill Proof uh, because it's not finished yet, but uh, I love the pre orders. All right. Any questions? Do I ever come to California to speak? Yes, I do. Hey, John, how are you doing? St. Louis. Hey, what's up, Max? Let's see. I don't think there's any many, very many questions. Did I do good? All right. I think I did all right. Cool. All right. So, uh, we're out of here. Give my back eye witch doctor. Ride safe, y'all. Oh, I bet.